Thanks, everyone, for hanging in there. Um, and I also want to thank anybody in the room who is already a participant in climatevoices.org. I really appreciate that, and I see several people uh, here today. I'm going to talk about Climate Voices, which is a relatively new program, and uh, the process of getting it established, and the lessons learned, and those that are not yet learned. Uh, this project began just before the IPCC released its report. Um, the United Nations Foundation had a grant from a Scandinavian foundation to uh, communicate climate science and the IPCC results in particular around the globe, but not in the US. I don't know if they'd given up on us or what, but, uh, but they did not include the US. So the United Nations Foundation came to the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, which is a consortium of over 100 universities. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Um, and uh, we used that uh, base of universities to begin to recruit scientists across the country to form a network of speakers, if you will, to uh, communicate at the local level. Very important. This is a local level uh, project. We began calling it the Scientist Citizen Initiative. You know about citizen scientist initiatives, and we sort of turned that on its head and said, we want scientists, citizens, going out into their communities and talking to local groups like Rotary, uh, faith-based institutions, libraries, um, audiences at the local level where they could speak with fellow citizens. Um, we have some additional support from the National Science Foundation, which put an interesting stipulation on this. This was some year-end money that we received. And uh, the, the NSF program officer was saying, the public does not know how serious this is and that it is likely that we will have to, at some point, use geoengineering if we're, and of course we are already in, in certain areas. Um, and the public needs to know more about how serious this is and what these uh, measures uh, could be in the future. So we are going ahead and creating some programming for geoengineering, too, that can be used with the public. You see the list of sponsors that we have right now, and just about my full-time job now is to uh, find other funding and additional sponsors. Um, the premise that we used uh, to build this program is that constructive dialogue in this country, which is um, sometimes hard to find, about climate change and adaptation mitigation policy will increase if citizens are better informed about the science and relevant issues. I mean, we all, I think, can agree on that. Supporting tenets are that scientists are trusted by the pu public, and I put in relatively speaking there, um, and can therefore be effective messengers, as uh, Richard was talking about, um, the sort of doctor approach. Uh, and that communication between scientists and citizens of their own communities will serve to engage people. Um, and again, that's that scientist-citizen concept. Uh, and that people who understand the issues are then far more motivated to act. The goals are to engage physical and social scientists in conversations. This is a really important point. We are not about having scientists go out and other, other uh, climate experts go out to the public and give scientific lectures. And this is hard for some people, um, obviously. A lot of scientists, faculty mem members, are uh, very good at giving scientific lectures. They're experts at this. But if you do that with the public, it's going to be, you're, gonna, you're, you're actually probably in some audiences going to be creating more harm than good. So our emphasis has been uh, provide a framework of information for these audiences, and I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on, uh, a bit more. But then, pretty quickly, turn to conversation. Talk with people about what change they're seeing at the local level, what kinds of things they're willing to do about it, and uh, how they want to get together on that. So really start discussions with people and empower uh, citizens to engage in effective action. And we've used um, the IPCC and NCA reports, obviously, uh, with an eye on really gearing up 
uh, for the 2015 Paris Climate Sum Summit uh, Conference and having the public understand how important that is, um, that progress. Now, obviously, you don't exist if you don't have a uh, website. So um, one of the first things we tried to do was uh, put together a website. And if you haven't done so already, please go to climatevoices.org and take a look at this. We tried to make it as accessible as possible to both the public and the academic community. So there are two key buttons on this website. One is find a speaker, and one is become a speaker. And uh, for become a speaker, if you go to that, um, you'll find that we've listed some qualifications. I mean, we've got uh, over 360 uh, scientists and climate experts across the country right now participating in Climate Voices. So you might ask, how in the world do you know that these people are qualified to go out and talk to the public? And I, I have to admit to you, I don't know that all of them really are, that they're able to do lay level uh, uh, presentations and discussions. But one of the things we do is say, uh, at the very least, we have two quotes here that you'll see if you go to the website. One says, essentially, humans are causing climate change. And the other says, an educated public is a really worthwhile thing. Um, so if you agree with these two then you can th t statements, then you can continue on. Um, I have had a scientist call me and say, I don't believe humans are causing climate change, but I am the best climate communicator in my state, so I need to be part of Climate Voices. And we had a good discussion, and I said, I'm sorry, but you know, we really uh, want to get the message out that humans are causing climate change, so I think this is probably not your program uh, to join. And he was very, we were all very civil about it. It was, it was great. Um, once you go, once you, once you continue on after you've looked at those qualifications, um, and the other qualifications are that uh, you need to have an advanced degree or a lot of, of experience in, uh, in climate communications and climate science. Uh, you create a profile. And I, there's a, uh, another point at which here, um, I can see all of these profiles before they go public. So if you put Donald Duck in there, Donald is not going to show up um, for the public. Um, the ones that haven't been approved are, are labeled pending, and I can go in, see what everybody's put in their profile, and then check uh, publish. And then you'll, your uh, profile is published. Um, you appear, when you go to find a speaker, um, your profile will appear if people go to your particular state or they put in your name or if you speak Spanish or some other language they can search by uh, languages spoken also. Then they can find uh, more information, this is Susie Moser, uh, more information about you and finally uh, you see that blue contact button. You can, a member of the public can contact these people directly. They don't have to go through me, but they contact them directly um, to invite them to come to uh, a local uh, event. Now, we also on the website have a number of resources and clean and other, you know, the, the programs that people have spoken about this morning, we have definitely. Uh, borrowed from uh, or, or publicized those on our website. We've got materials for, that people can use for presentations and uh, we've got uh, classroom materials that teachers can use. And one other thing that we do to make, to make as sure as we possibly can that people are prepared to go talk to the public about climate science is um, to do webinars, uh, for training, and uh, Aaron Hurtis has done one of those. I see him in the audience. And um, we, we do these about, oh, once a month or so. And we've also uh, teamed up with AAAS and other organizations to do some workshops across the country. Now, I can see who's been contacted and we can follow up uh, with them, find out how the event went if the scientist got back in touch with these people um, and, uh, and how they think the event went. Um, we've had uh, 
people go out to various audiences. This is a lot of praise for Laura Tannenbaum in a K-12 classroom. And uh, that picture is the class there that made up a climate change song and sent it to us. It was, um, it was cute, but it wasn't worth playing this morning. Um, <laughs> And uh, we've had some people uh, go out and do radio and television programming, too. This is Jim Anderson at Arizona State University. Sierra Club came to us and said, um, we would like to use some of your speakers across the country. And, uh, and I talked to them. I said, oh, well, if you're Sierra Club, we're only going to reach um, liberal audiences, right? And they said, no, we're not going to say it's Sierra Club uh, in order to try to reach a broader audience. I mean, one of the things we're very serious about is trying to get to broad audiences, mixed audiences, not just preach to the choir all the time, but really get to um, that, uh, you know, middle uh, of the six Americas uh, audiences. And more to the right, too. Um, and speaking of that, we are really targeting rot rotary clubs because they are ubiquitous. We've got scientists in every state, all 50 states, and we want eventually to be targeting um, rotary clubs in all 50 states, too. These are mixed audiences. They tend toward the more conservative. And they have speakers every single week. So um, this is a very good audience for us. I did not pay this guy to say all these wonderful things um, about court uh, here. But what I loved was uh, my Rotary Club, which has overtones, undertones, and in-between tones of conservatives, liked him. So I think he did a great job. Now, I've just shown you quotes about uh, you know, how wonderful these people have been when they go out. And um, we had one, it's not, you know, it's not all hunky-dory, obviously. We had one um, very accomplished, very good um, scientist go to an optimist club and just about get laughed out of the room. Um, people saying, we know that you just do this to get money. You don't really believe this. No. So um, we thought, you know, we, we have a long way to go here. And um, we need to figure out different ways in which to approach audiences like that. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a bit. Since uh, mid-April, when we launched the website, we've had about 7,500 hits. Um, and somehow, I don't know how Google Analytics does it, but they say that it's a younger age group. Um, and given how many times I've accessed the website, I don't know why the right side of that isn't higher. but. Um, uh, challenges and some of the approaches. Recruiting scientists. So at first, um, I did this broadcast. You know, we have this wonderful UCAR consortium of universities. Did this broadcast to the deans and chairs and heads and everybody and got not much at all. Um, so then, hired, a, didn't hire, this was free, had a high school intern go through and find individuals at every university we could possibly find across the country and invited them to join Climate Voices, invited these scientists and faculty members to join Climate Voices personally, and that worked. And that's how we've gotten to over 360 participants now. Um, one of the major challenges is building awareness of this program. And if I could get the help of everybody in the audience on that, that would be terrific because it's tough to do. You can't just put out a press release and expect you all to come. Um, you have to really, really keep at it. Um, so we have established partnerships with all sorts of people. Um, and institutions in uh, trying to get um, the climate voices out there so that the public can use it. And we're beginning to use um, social media a bit more, too. I have 10 seconds, is that right? OK. Um, and uh, with communication skills building, I've already talked about that a bit. Um, and let me do one major issue is determining metrics for success. And uh, we are working more and more um, on that, but th it's, it's tough to do. And we are trying to find additional funding, too, for um, uh, people to work on this. And that's, as I said, is my full-time job at this point. So I will stop there, except I do want to say, I was going to show you a little bit about the uh, slide program that we make available. and. The one thing I want to show you at the end is what you can do is how we end up with our audiences. And what you can do in the audience is join Climate Voices if you haven't already. So 
Thanks so much. I really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you.